I'm Namal De Silva. Welcome to the Birdability Birders webinar series. These are conversations about birding with access challenges. Um, I am your co-host. Freya McGregor will be the co-host and interviewer for this series. Jerry Barrier is, of course, our guest today. Um, Paula Mayer is here. Thank you for providing sign language interpretation. Um, and we also have Erica Sanchez Vasquez behind the scenes. You won't see her, but she's there. Um, and also will be, um, she'll be providing technical support throughout this and um, will also be helping us with the chat. Um, welcome everyone. It's great to see you. Um, as I said before, my name is Namal De Silva. I am the Chief Diversity Officer for American Bird Conservancy. I'm so happy that you're joining us for this second episode of the Birdability series. Um, this is co-hosted by American Bird Conservancy and Birdability. Um, so American Bird Conservancy, where I work, um, we work with many partners throughout the Americas to halt extinctions, to safeguard habitats, and to build capacity for bird conservation. We want more people to enjoy and care for birds and for the environment, including people who have been historically ignored within the conservation field. So that includes birders and conservationists with disabilities. Um, Birdability is a new organization that uses education, outreach, and advocacy to make the birding community and the outdoors more welcoming, inclusive, safe, and accessible for everybody. Birdability focuses on people with mobility challenges, blindness or low vision, chronic illness, intellectual or dis developmental disabilities, mental illness, and those who are neurodivergent, deaf or hard of hearing, or who have other health concerns. In addition to current birders, Birdability strives to introduce birding to people with disabilities and other health concerns who are not yet birders so that they too can experience the joys of birding. Um, ABC works on bird conservation, but we see birding as a gateway into caring for birds and um, helping to protect birds and their habitats. So let me introduce our guests. Um, our guest our guest today is Jerry Barrier, totally blind from birth. Jerry Barrier worked for Verizon Communications for 24 years. Since 2003, he worked as an assistive technology specialist, most recently as director of assistive technology for the Perkins School of the, for the Blind. He retired in June of 2021. Congratulations, Jerry. He has been birding by year since 1972 and has served as an accessibility consultant with Massachusetts Audubon, Mass Audubon, on more than a dozen all persons trails projects. For several years, he has been invited by LL Bean to conduct birding by ear workshops at their annual spring birding event in Freeport, Maine, and has conducted numerous birding programs for adults and children who are blind. Our co-host, Freya McGregor, is the birdability coordinator and she'll be serving as the interviewer for all six of these webinars. Freya is an occupational therapist and her experience with modifying the physical and cultural environments, adapting tasks and equipment to enable participation and developing public health programs helps guide birdability's approach. Her own background is in blindness and low vision services. So this particular webinar is extremely exciting for us. Erica Sanchez Vasquez works within ABC's communications team. That's the hummingbird logo that you see on there, but Erica's behind there. Um, she's done a lot of the work that enables us to bring you this webinar series. She'll be supporting us behind the scenes. Um, with that, thank you for continuing to put your names in the chat and, uh, um, uh, and for saying why you're joining us today. Please put your questions in the Q&A box and I'm gonna hand it over to Freya. Thank you. Thanks so much, Namal. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Freya McGregor. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And as Namal said, I'm the Birdability Coordinator. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight with Jerry and with Namal and Erica. Um, and I'd like to thank um, the American Bird Conservancy for this really awesome partnership. It's exciting to be doing this, and especially tonight, because Jerry was the inspiration for this whole series. And he has been waiting for a full year for this to happen. So it's really exciting to be able to do this. Um, 
I just want to um, acknowledge that I am coming to you from uh, uh, from Alabama, which was um, and still is the lands of the Muscogee Creek people. Um, many of the Muscogee Nation were forcibly removed by the US government to what was then called Indian Territory, but there are still Muscogee uh, people today in Alabama. And I would like to acknowledge and uh, extend my gratitude to um, their on, past and ongoing stu stewardship of the land on which I live, work and go birding on. Um, as as Namal mentioned, we have um, an ASL interpreter, we have closed captions, um, and we'll also be providing Jerry with an honorarium. Um, these are uh, things that cost more money um, than, than not doing these things, but they're part of being an inclusive organization. And I could talk more about that, but that's not the point of today. I just wanted to let you know um, that we're doing this um, because, because we think this is really important. Um, I also want to mention that throughout this series, we'll be talking to a really interesting, diverse group of birders who have all different kinds of experiences um, and values and um, access challenges, but we don't make any claim that this is representative of every kind of birder or even every kind of birder with access challenges. Um, we, we would invite you to consider whose voices are not being heard in this series and who um, and how you might be able to ensure that they, they're included in the work that you do in your own community and what we can do to make sure that, that everybody can, can experience the joys of birding. Um, I also just want to make a disclaimer too that we don't make any claim that um, the individuals interviewed in this series are representing everybody with a similar access challenge to them and that the views expressed are only those person's individual views. Although some of it may apply more broadly, but it's just one person's. Yeah, I'm going to jump in just to say that um, I think I was probably speaking too quickly and maybe we both speak rather quickly. There was one comment about slowing down a little bit. Um, okay. So let's do that as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sure. Um, finally, um, one more thing. Um, one thing that we do at BirdAbility is try and ensure that the birding community is a safe place for, uh, for every birder and that includes the online birding community. So um, if there's any kind of racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, sexist kind of comments in the chat. Um, folks will get an opportunity to um, clarify your intent or apologize. Um, and if that doesn't happen, you'll be asked to leave. Um, that's really awkward for me to have to say, and it will be much more awkward if we actually have to do this, but um, our discomfort is much less significant than any harm that might be caused to, to other people who are attending uh, or um, staff or um, panel, uh, uh, Jerry, who, who's here tonight. And so we just want to make sure that everyone feels welcome and, and safe in this environment. Um, and finally, yes, if you're new to BirdAbility, um, please check out our website. It's birdability.org. We have a lot of information up there about um, the physical um, accessibility of birding locations, about how you can be a more welcoming and inclusive birder, uh, resources for birders who have different access challenges. Um, and you can also follow us on social media at BirdAbility. Uh, so we encourage you to do that. Uh, and because we're a nonprofit and we're only less than a year old, donations are really, really appreciated. So um, birdability.org slash donate is um, the place to go if you feel so inclined. Any donation is very much appreciated. Okay, uh, that's enough from me. Jerry. Hello, <laughs> welcome. <Hi>. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Jerry Barrier, and um, I live in Massachusetts near Boston. And I am, as um, uh, was mentioned, I am totally blind and have been since birth. And I have no other significant disabilities, although as I get older, my high frequency hearing very sadly has gone down significantly to the point where sometimes people will say, what is that bird I hear? And I'll think, I don't hear anything. But, uh, but other than that, I have no other disabilities. And I'm happy to be here tonight. And Freya, I'm happy to answer, try to answer any question you ask. I'm not sensitive uh, to speak of, and I'm happy to, happy to talk openly, as openly as I can. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. So um, how did you first get into birding? 
It happened during a uh, biology class when I was in college. I was a psych major, and but I had to take one biology class. And the professor didn't know what to do with me for the lab portion of the, the class. And he didn't want to just leave that part out for me. So he gave me what I believe is one of the greatest gifts I've been given in my life. And I don't think he even realized the import of it. But his idea was that I would borrow his uh, 33 and a third speed big record albums of Cornell University uh, bird recordings. And I would listen to them during the semester from my dorm. And at the end of the semester, he and I would go for a walk and he would ask me to identify what we heard. And my grade would be primarily based on how well I did that. And I remember when I first started, you know, I was a sophomore, not a real serious minded student. And I thought, oh, my, these birds, like Robin, Cardinal, Blackbird, they all sound the same to me. But by the end of the semester, I was totally hooked. And it became my lifelong hobby and, and passion. And I've continued to do it uh, since then. So that was back in probably 1972 when I had that class. That was a wonderful beginning for me of a, of a new avocation. That's awesome. I, and I, what I really love about that story is that your, um, your professor thought outside the box about yes. a way to include you in something um, and ended up giving you this, this wonderful gift. Um, so there are, there are many joys of birding. What is it about birding that keeps bringing you back to it? It's the sounds of the birds. Uh, it's learning that they're, that I am related to my environment and to the sunrise and sunset and to other people who share that common ground with me uh, because of their interest in birds. Uh, that's a big part of it for me. Um, I look forward to spring. I'm already lamenting the winter and it hasn't even started yet. And I begin looking forward to spring around this time of the year because right now the birds are relatively quiet and it's not a good time for someone who only does their birding by ear. I still hear the common birds in my neighborhood, blue jays and a few cardinals and once in a while a robin clucking. They don't all migrate. Some of them do, but not all of them. Um, but I guess, well, let me just come right out and say that I know uh, by not being able to see that I miss a lot of the visual, I miss all of the visual beauty that is out there that people have uh, ample opportunity to partake of. And by the way, just describing something to me doesn't do it. I mean, you can you can tell me how beautiful a bird is and how wonderful it is to see a, uh, a red-tailed red hawk as it swoops and dives. Um, and I'm, I'm fascinated by that. I'm very fascinated by it. But I want more than that. I need something that I can latch onto that I can feel is beauty uh, that's available to me. And sound is probably the greatest way I get it. Um, I like hearing birds out in the wild. Um, I'm okay with people having pet birds, although I don't have any. My son has a couple of parrots and I love playing around with them and listening to them and hearing them chatter and so on and letting them uh, sit on my hand. But I really get my satisfaction and joy from hearing birds who are singing in their natural habitat and not just singing, I love owls. I absolutely love listening to crows. I don't want to, I shouldn't admit this, but sometimes when I hear a crow above me, I think it's talking directly to me and, and I try to uh, telepathically talk back to it, but I don't know if it ever gets that or not, but I love it. I just absolutely love it. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't be the first person who, who wanted to have a conversation <laughs> with a crow. I know back, back home in Australia, our laughing kookaburras, um, seem to always laugh right when you're in a bad mood. And I've had many <laughs> conversations with kookaburras. I don't know that they cared, but um, <laughs> that's awesome. So um, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be totally blind and how it, um, how it sort of impacts your everyday life and what activities it makes a little more challenging for you than for sighted folks? 
Well, in my home, uh, there's not very much that's challenging to me. Um, I, I have a cane, which I don't use when I'm in the house. I know my house perfectly. I know it better than my wife does at night. Um, I often kind of laugh to myself when she's, you know, trying to find something and find her way out of the room and it doesn't have the lights on and it's difficult for her. Those things are not difficult for me. I've lived as a blind person all my life. Um, fortunately, my parents allowed me to, to experience things and try things and they didn't hold me back. And yes, I have fallen maybe down the steps a couple of times in my life, but I probably have fallen fewer times than most sighted people because I am careful and uh, I have ways of making sure I know exactly where I am. There's nothing worse for a blind person than when you feel sure you know where you are, but you really don't. That's when bad mistakes can happen. So I try to be aware of, of my environment. So <clears throat> the things that are most challenging, challenging for me are getting from, from one place to another and being able to get out in the field and do birding on my own. Uh, that's very difficult uh, because I'm usually confined to a certain area that I'm familiar with and can't just go out and really wander around the woods. Maybe some other blind people are able to do that, but that's not something I've been able to accomplish. So it's that's one of the difficulties. Uh, not being able to drive is a huge disadvantage, uh, although that's been ameliorated somewhat by the, the various uh, on-demand transportation programs that are available today. That's been, that's been really great for me, and I use them all the time. But those are things, you know, reading things, um, operating my electrical appliances in the kitchen is difficult because not all of them are accessible to me. Um, but I would say the biggest things are probably transportation and um, being in unfamiliar surroundings and, and trying to navigate and negotiate. Um, there's more that I'm probably not thinking of, but I wouldn't, I, I want to really be sure to point out that not being able to see is a very difficult thing to adjust to. I know that. I've been a counselor working with people who lost their sight as adults, and it's very difficult, but it is not the end of the world. And I don't think having a disability defines the degree of happiness and fulfillment that a person can find in their life. Uh, that comes from other things. Mm -hmm. And um, I find I, I've been... I learned at an early age that I'm responsible for finding things that bring joy into my life. And they may not be the same things that bring joy to you, but it's really important that I find some of those things. And birding has been one of them and probably one of the biggest in my entire life. I want to go back and say something too about my uh, professor and about my wife. Just recently, I was saying to my wife, you know, I should have thanked that professor a long time ago and he's probably deceased by now. And she insisted, and this is, we're talking about back from 1972. And this uh, last summer we were talking about it and she just kept after me, contact the school where you went and find out if he's still alive. Well, I did contact him and it turns out that he ha is deceased, but I met another professor who's a retired biology prof professor who has a friend who's blind, who's interested in birds. And the three of us have been meeting monthly on Zoom ever since then and have just developed just a fantastic relationship. So this, 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 what this professor did for me just continues to keep giving in my life uh, one way or another. It's really interesting. Yeah, that's awesome. And I've heard people talk about your circle of influence and that everybody has a circle of influence. It might not be a gigantic you know, you might not be a newscaster or something, but everyone has some kind of influence and that that professor's influence on you and then your influence on these other folks and and all the people here tonight. Like there's already been, I've just seen a few comments in the chat um, of folks who are really glad to listen to you. So it's it's really awesome to know that, you know, you can have positive impacts on, on other people. Um, thanks for sharing all that, Jerry. Um, so... Could you, you mentioned your long cane. Uh, could you give us a little tour of your long cane and explain a little bit about what it is and why it's useful for you? I certainly can. I just happen to have one right here with me. So this is it. 
Um, not all canes fold up, but it's very convenient to have one that does. Um, the disadvantage of a folding cane is that it is not quite as sturdy as one that doesn't fold up, uh, but I'll just unfold mine here and it's got a really strong elastic band in it, so it's pretty rigid. Um, blind people don't lean on their canes, or at least they're not supposed to. We use a, a different, it's not a support cane in any way. To be a good cane, in my opinion, the cane has to have the right kind of a tip. I happen to have one with a, um, I don't know what this material is, Freya, that the tip is made out of. It's not fiberglass. Anyway, some, it's some a- kind of plastic. Right? Yeah, it, yes. It's Could a you hold it a little bit higher up? Sure. Perfect, that's it. Yeah, got it. So the, the tip is a, it's rounded at the end so that when I, when I encounter um, construction seams or bumps in the sidewalk, it's not going to stop me every time and, uh, you know, really give me a jolt. Uh, so that's important. And it's also important to some of us older blind uh, folks uh, who learned to cane, learn to listen for the sound that our cane made. Uh, when I tap it, I swing it from side to side in an arc that theoretically covers the width of my shoulders. And um, as I swing it, I tap it and I can hear sounds bouncing off. Uh, when I was younger, I was able to hear really well. I could walk down the sidewalk and count telephone poles by sensing their presence, partly by this tapping of my cane, but also partly just by some innate sense that a lot of blind people have that some people think it's similar to how bats perceive things. Uh, it's a type of echolocation. But anyway, the cane, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, Freya, but I can really get off on a tangent pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. That's great. Could you, and I know, so my, yeah, my, my professional background as an occupational therapist is in blindness and low vision services. And um, there's, there's a whole, in, in broader contexts, um, occupational therapy does a lot of stuff around community mobility and knowing where you are and how you get around out, you know, going to the shops or whatever. But um, because there's so much, um, in that for folks who are blind or have low vision, there's a whole different profession um, called orientation and mobility specialists and they teach folks how to use a cane, right? Yes, um, that's correct. And it, it requires a lot of training. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not a, not a simple matter of giving the person the, the cane and say, hey, go out and have a good time. Um, it requires training on what to do when you get disoriented, um, how to try and walk in a straight line, which is very important if you're crossing a street. And mm -hmm. I've certainly made plenty of errors that could have gotten me killed uh, because, you know, and I try to remember this, when I bump into something, which I don't do that often really, but when I do, I try to remember, I am a blind person. Blind people do bump into things and by, blind people also get disoriented at times. But the cane, um, basically tells me what is right in front of me that I may either be coming to a, a step or a set of steps. Um, by the way, I, I stepped off the top of a, a set of outside steps that had 25 steps once and somehow miraculously went all the way to the bottom, landed on my feet and did not get injured. But that that's, that's a rarity. You know, it's it's a risky business at best for a blind person that really gets adventurous and gets out there and go in, goes into unfamiliar territories. But the cane does a couple of things. It serves as an identifier. When somebody sees that cane, I think most people know right away, okay, that's a blind person. And I carry a cane when my wife and I are going places, even though I don't really need it when I'm, when I'm walking with her, but I like for people to know who I am and what I am so that, uh, that just so they're aware uh, mm -hmm. that I'm a blind person. Mm -hmm. uh, the cane, the size of the cane is really important. Usually it's measured to come up to your sternum or, or possibly up to your armpit. Uh, but again, there are different schools of thought on that. Some people have very long canes that are higher than the top of my head, uh, but I've never gotten used to using one of those. But there, there is a lot that goes into designing the cane. They need to be very lightweight. If you're going to be swinging it for an hour at a time as you walk along, you don't want something that's going to be heavy and be a burden to your to your wrist and so on. 
So mm-hmm. there are lots of things I could I could go into about it, but I know we just wanted a brief overview. So <laughs> and and I know too, um, they're usually reflective to just help other people yes. who are sighted see them, and um, very often white, um, which I believe is the international color for um, folks who are blind or have low vision. So long cane and white cane are the two names that I've heard for for this amazing tool. Um, and also the tips really quickly before we go into the next question. Um, I know there's different kinds of tips for different purposes. And have you ever used, um, they called it the bushwhacking tip back in Australia. <laughs> like there's a there's one that's kind of long and it comes down and then it goes flat. And have you ever used that? Um, I haven't used adventures? that. I've tried one called the marshmallow tip and I've tried ones that have rollers on them. One that has like a big ball in the end that can roll. And those are great if you're a person who just keeps the, the tip touching the ground and slides it from side to side, which I think they're teaching more these days, mm-hmm. but they don't tap well like the kind of cane I use. I will say one more thing about a cane, and that is that some people misunderstand its purpose. Just recently, <clears throat> I used one of the transportation services to take me to a place, and I said, I need you to drop me off at the at the steps, at a big set of, set of metal steps. And I said, is that where we are? And the driver said, yes. And I started walking and realized pretty quickly that I was in the middle of a big parking lot. I didn't know which way to go. And recognizing that I was in trouble, he got out of his car and came and grabbed my cane by the tip and pulled me to the steps with it. That was not an ideal way to guide mm-hmm. me, but mm-hmm. I didn't, I chose not to, uh, not to say anything. Um, but that's not what the cane's for. It's not for somebody to guide you with, um, but it's it does serve a lot of purposes. Yeah, yeah. So that um, I'm going to skip a question about the dog guide. We might come back to that if we have a bit more time at the end. Um, mm-hmm. But um, so speaking of help, a lot of people often from, you know, trying to be kind, want to help folks with different disabilities. Um what is the best kind of help for you to receive? And what do you want folks offering you help to know? I like people to ask me what sort of help I need, number one, because that way I can tell them exactly what I need. Um, If they're going to help me get to a place, I need to be able to take their arm right above the elbow. Uh, Because that puts me automatically a half step behind them. And every turn they make, every time they go to step up or down, I'm aware of it a split second before I need to be. And it's a beautiful way of walking along and being guided by a sighted person. Uh, It requires little effort from what I understand on the part of the sighted person, especially once they get used to it. And uh, it it works exceedingly well. But if, if someone grabs me by the arm and starts pushing me along, I have no information to speak of I don't know what we're coming to. I don't know whether the person's making a turn. Uh, So it's really critical that the person allow me to take their arm. Uh, That's the kind of help I probably need more often than than anything. Um, Or, you know, there are lots of other situations that are difficult for a person who's blind, like cafeteria lines and buffet lines and that sort of thing. Um, And I'm more than willing to accept help from people, even sometimes when I don't need it, because I appreciate the offer. And, um, but if I do, if it's a situation, well, like I used to, when I first started working at a place, I had to learn the area and I had to become independent and people would offer to walk with me and I would thank them, but say, no, I'm in learning mode right now. And it would be much easier to me for me to just accept the help and have people lead me around everywhere, but that's not independence. It's not the kind of independence that I want. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So, yeah, I remember learning sighted guide technique um, where where a sighted person like myself, um, mm-hmm. the, the, the kind of the, the preferred way to help someone um, get around a place like you were describing with their hand, uh, like your hand above, holding onto the back of my arm just above my elbow. Correct. Um, and yeah, it doesn't, it really doesn't take any effort um, on, on my part, uh, only, only that I'm more aware of going through narrow spaces so that, because you're sort of behind and next to me at the same time. And I don't want to like walk you into a door frame. Yes. Um, yeah. And also um, I tend to verbalize a bit more about 
you know, here come some steps, you know, there's three steps up, that kind of thing. Um, do you find that sort of information helpful if someone was, was being your sighted guide? I do. Um, I don't require a lot of information like that, but it certainly doesn't hurt to know that we're just about to come to a flight of steps. <laughs> <laughs> or like we're stopping here, there's a road or something. Yes. Um, yeah. Sort of signaling verbally. Um, and the other thing I remember learning is that, um, you know, if, if I grabbed your arm, I was like, we're going over here. Um, me grabbing you um, could be really scary and also really disempowering but if you're holding on to me you can opt out whenever you want you can just let go mm -hmm. if you don't want to go that way anymore and so that was I remember thinking that was a really key difference between who's holding who in this yes. situation absolutely yeah um so okay if if someone, if you were out birding with a group or, or you just randomly met someone on a trail and they were hearing a bird and they were trying to help you get on it. Um, I know a lot of sighted people talk about helping someone get on a bird, like to direct them visually to that bird, but how would it be helpful for someone to help you kind of tune in to one particular bird that was making noise? Well, it certainly isn't helpful to say it's over there. Uh, can you hear it? It's right over there. <laughs> but it's very helpful if someone says that the bird is actually looks like it's about 20 feet up in a tree and it's about at two, two o'clock from where you're standing. And I find that very helpful. Sometimes when I go out with my wife, who's not really a birder, but she's gotten interested in it for me and sometimes hears birds that I don't hear. Uh, but I I sometimes take a parabolic microphone with me and it's very difficult for me as a blind person to actually orient that accurately. It's much easier for somebody to look if they can see the bird mm -hmm. and help me point the microphone right to it. Uh, I also use a shotgun mic at times, which is also dependent on uh, being able to aim it right at what it is I'm trying to hear. So specific directions that use the clock face are probably better than anything for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and the height you mentioned like 20 yes. feet up or something yeah. yeah awesome and what about um what about the colors of a bird I think you sort of touched on this earlier but a lot of sighted people get really excited about you know bright blue birds or a bird that has many colors does is that of interest to you well I'm fairly sure that a blue jay is blue um Yep. But I used to be sure that a red-bellied woodpecker had a red belly, and somebody told me that's not exactly true, that they have a red patch on their belly. But the truth is, all joking aside, that color means very little to me. Um, I, I like to hear about it a little bit. But if you go, if you spend too much time describing uh, the various aspects, it just goes in one ear and out the other, because I I really have no frame of reference to use for it, even though I try to understand it. And there are colors that will uh, evoke certain um, things in my mind. Like if somebody says, oh, I don't know, if somebody says white, I might think of snow, but only because I've heard that it's white. Mm -hmm. Or if they say red, I think of uh, pepper or something hot. And mm -hmm. if I think of blue, I think of maybe water or something cool, but that's the best I can do with it because color is just something that I have no ability to actually experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what, is there another way if someone was trying to describe what they were seeing to you about a bird in a way that would be, is there another way to do it that would be more interesting and, and more valuable to you? I heard a description of a bird that said this bird its body is about the size and shape of a tangerine. And that really meant something to me. Mm -hmm. um, I like to hear what things are shaped like and maybe uh, how big they are in comparison to something else. If somebody says it's a robin sized bird, I have sort of an idea of how big a robin is. So that gives me a great frame of reference. Um, wingspans, I find very fascinating. When I first heard that a uh, that a, a bald eagle might have a five or six foot wingspan. I was amazed at that. I just had no idea. Um, and things about the, the way the beak looks and um, maybe a little bit about their tail feathers and that sort of thing. But uh, those are much better descriptors to me than the colors are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And a tangerine, you know what that is. Like you, yeah. you know 
you can med yeah what about their behavior are you interested in knowing like what that bird's up to in that moment if it's hopping on the ground or scratching in leaf litter or anything like soaring is that I'm very I'm very interested in that although not being able to see birds I I haven't learned all that much about their behavior you know I can't really study them uh other than the sounds that they make uh but yes I'm very interested in knowing what are they doing what are they what are they trying to to get to eat and uh, you know how high up in the tree do they go and how much time do they spend on the ground and I like hearing things like that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so anything that someone can some, someone can see about what a bird's up to you're interested in except the color yes <laughs> I'm so, I, I like to be I want to be interested in that but it's very difficult so it, it, I mean yeah. if it doesn't really mean anything it's hard yeah. to be interested um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you that's that's really interesting and and um, really helpful I'm sure for I know there's a few people here tonight who um, have said that they're blind or they have a friend who's blind. So I'm sure that this kind of information will be really helpful um, to them. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about language. And we know that language is always evolving and, you know, words and their meanings change. Um, and one way that people can be welcoming and inclusive of, of other people is, is to be mindful of the language choices that they use. And so I wondered about your thoughts on the word handicapped and if you identify as disabled i um when i was young uh, i remember somebody helping me fill out a job application and one of the questions was and this was a very standard question do you consider yourself to be handicapped and at that time that was the common terminology and it was very much accepted but we've learned over the years that that's somewhat of a derogatory term it implies um uh, I don't want to say helplessness, but it implies someone who is dependent on other people for their livelihood and for their existence even. So I, I don't care for the word handicapped other than talking about parking spaces or maybe golf handicaps, but I don't, I never use the word handicap with regard to people. Mm -hmm. um, I do say I'm a person with a disability and I'm very comfortable saying I'm a blind person. Uh, or a person who is blind. What I don't like are terms that are that are well-meaning, but are either patronizing, ableistic, or in any other way demeaning to uh, people who are blind. Uh, a couple of examples, and you know, now especially now that I know we have other blind people on board, I'll say I'm not re representative of other blind people. But my opinion is I really dislike words like differently abled, that implies that when you're given a disability that you're also given something to replace it. And it's not necessarily true. When we have a disability, we have a disability and we learn to cope with it, but we're not given magically miraculous um, senses and other things that, that other people don't have. So I don't like that. I don't like handy capable because that sounds awful, <laughs> just awful. Um, there are other ones that I can't think of right now. Well, I've had people talk about people who are blind as unsighted. And that's that's okay, but it's an awkward term. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of being unsightly, and I don't want to be unsightly either. Mm -hmm. um, but unsighted, you know, is it, at least that's a, an attempt at saying something that is that is not uh, demeaning. Um, but I'm I'm fine with saying things as they are. Mm -hmm. A person who's blind is blind, and I don't shy away from that at all. I'm, I'm very comfortable with it, and most of my friends who are blind are too, just as I'm comfortable with people using terminology that, that is used by sighted people like see you later and that sort of thing. I have absolutely no problem with that, and I'm very comfortable. I try to be comfortable living in the sighted world the best I can, and uh, so I'm okay with terms like that. Yeah, that was my next question is if I said to you at the end, see you later, would that would that be offensive? Would you get no, not in any way? In fact, we we blind folks say it to each other all the time or those, you know, they'll say I was watching. I, I have to admit, I don't say that I watch movies. I just I'm not comfortable saying that. But most of my friends who are blind do say that. And it's perfectly fine. 
It's the terminology people use to say that I experienced a movie last night, whether you experience it visually or auditorily with audio descriptions or by somebody sitting beside you and telling you what's going on, you still watch the movie. So it's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> sure. Um, and speaking of actually speaking of audio descriptions, um, how do you access information that someone has like sent you as an email or um, the internet? You know, the internet is, I read it. It's a visual process for me. How do you access um, electronic printed material? I do it mostly with um, audio output on my computer. I use a, a program called JAWS, J-A-W-S, which stands for Job Access with Speech. It's a, a screen reader, which uh, is able to read to me what's on the screen very selectively. I can turn punctuation on and off. I can say I only, only want to hear headings on a website. I can navigate by links, by all kinds of other things. Um, it's a, it has evolved over the years into a very sophisticated uh, program that is that most people who use find it hard to learn. But once you learn it, and there's always more to learn, but it's very useful. And I use it every single day, 365 days a year. I'm on my computer all the time. I use a standard keyboard. I don't have anything special on my keyboard. In fact, I kind of scoff at, at people, and, and I shouldn't say I scoff at them because some people really do need extra uh, dots and things on the keyboard. But mm -hmm. when I worked as a, uh, an access technology trainer, I, I discouraged people from using those because on a standard desktop keyboard, there's enough space between the sections of the keys and so on that it's it's not difficult to learn to use one. So I don't have anything different with my keyboard, but my computer is just a regular computer that has this added software that gives me the ability to hear it. Um, I also have a Braille display, which is a refreshable one line 80 cell display uh, in front of me that I can use. And I often will use it if I hear a word spoken by, by JAWS, which speaks very clearly, by the way, but if I hear a word that I'm not sure whether it said DOSS, D-O-S-S, -S, or BOSS, B-O-S-S, -S, I can reach over and read it in Braille and confirm it. And if I want to read a phone number back to somebody, I can do it. Uh, but primarily, I use speech, and I also use it on my iPhone. And when somebody told me that I could learn to use an iPhone a long time ago, I couldn't believe it because it's got a flat screen on it. Mine doesn't even have a home button. Mm -hmm. I just accidentally started mine. I started mine reading a book. I'm trying to stop it now. <laughs> well, I can't seem to stop it, and I'm not going to waste time on that. But I was listening to a uh, an audio book, and I accidentally just hit the wrong command and started it reading. So, uh, no worries. I I was wondering if you want to like even. Maybe you don't want to share your book with us, but but I think it would be really cool to hear um, how VoiceOver, the screen reader software on an iPhone, how it reads. Okay, you. and I, I did manage to stop the book, so uh, let's see. Let me. Um, I'm going to. Okay, I'm on my home screen, and I'll turn the screen on. So if anybody, I don't know if you can see it, but. There's something called a screen curtain that is, you can turn the screen off if you're a person using a phone and you're blind so that other people are not seeing what you're mm -hmm. not seeing. <laughs> so I'm now um, have my home screen on, I'll turn the volume up a little bit. And there are a, a, an important series of gestures, flicks, taps, double taps, three finger taps, and even four finger taps and swipes that enable me to do all the different things on the phone. And I'm using an iPhone, but these, uh, these characteristics are available on some Android phones also. But with the iPhone, almost since its inception, this uh, product called VoiceOver has built in, been built into the iPhone. It doesn't cost extra. It's just a matter of activating it. And then I can uh, move through my home screen until I get to the uh, particular app I want. 20 minute timer. There's a 20 minute timer. ADT folder. For IRA. 
app store burning folder three app club burning folder burning three folder apps. that's one of my favorites I have several yeah. apps in there. <laughs> <laughs> one that i use is called lark wire which is a really uh good app for learning bird sounds and testing yourself and i also use merlin bird id and a couple of the other ones um no worries just, there he, yeah. sorry thank you that was really cool i i just wanted to be folks to hear how fast the voiceover software is speaking to you because um, I know I speak really fast and some people can follow really fast speech, but, but screen reader software can go so quickly and, and you can, you can follow that just fine. It's, yes. it's really cool. Although I know other blind people who go a lot faster than I do. Uh, but we all, even when we listen to audio books, I was listening to one this afternoon and I have it set at one, 1 1.75 times normal speed. So it's almost at double speed and I have no trouble understanding at all. I like, I like speech that's accurate and fast. <laughs> yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. So, okay, if um, what sort of things would you like? Sorry, total change of topic. Um, thank you for thank you for the demo of your of your <laughs> um of your iPhone. Um, what sort of things would you like sighted people to know about birding with someone who's totally blind, and how can they be welcoming and inclusive of you if you? met them on a trail or if you um, showed up to a, an organized bird outing or something? I will say that one of my biggest challenges as a blind birder has been finding people who are willing to go birding with me. Um, a lot of people are fearful. Uh, they're afraid, what if I bump him into a tree or something? And they're just, uh, I mean, the, the fact is a lot of people have never met a person who's blind and they're just not sure what to expect. So they tend to, to not offer uh, an arm to me and, and invite me to go with them. That, that's been one of my greatest challenges. Um, and fortunately, my wife, who, as I said, is not was never a birder and, and has only gotten interested in it through her involvement with me in the last few years, um, she goes out with me and will walk, we take walks in a local cemetery, that, which is a great place because it's quiet. And there's a pond there and geese and ducks and things and, and lots of wildlife. But I would like people to know that, number one, you're not going to offend me if you use some wrong terminology or something that I am not used to, or if you ask me a question. Um, I'm very comfortable with who I am. Um, I don't get upset if somebody reminds me that I'm blind, but in some way by asking me a question, I'm as comfortable. In fact, I almost am proud of it sometimes, not that I would have selected or elected to be a person with a disability, because I don't know who would really, given the option, but I am very proud that I'm able to um, uh, to get along fine with a disability and have found ways and have had lots of help along the way uh, to learn how to deal with it. So I want people to know that I'm comfortable in my own skin and I'm comfortable be, being around other people and that I'm not likely to, to make them uncomfortable either. And I also want, I want, to, I want people to understand that, well, I sometimes think that people, when they find that I'm birding by ear, their immediate thought is, wow, that poor guy, he's missing most of what there is in this birding because he can't see what's going on. And in, in one respect, that's true. I totally understand uh, that I cannot see the bird and follow its movements and see what it looks like and, you know, being be in awe of its beauty. But it's, it's probably a an inappropriate judgment to judge just how much joy and how much uh, how much I can get out of being out in the woods and being around birds and experiencing the sounds that they make and the, the smells of the trees and the plants and the flowers and so on. It may be that I derive more joy from my sense of smell and my hearing sometimes than some people do who can see. So it's... Um, I don't want people to think that I'm not getting something out of it. I absolutely love it. And, mm -hmm. and I think I'm able to kind of uh, spread that a little bit to other people. I think um, other people are sometimes buoyed up by the questions I ask and the comments that I make. 
because I have the enthusiasm and that can become contagious. And so it can be, you can actually have fun with me, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And people who do go with me have said that, that uh, mm -hmm. they really enjoy spending the time with me. Uh, for the most part, I'm just a regular guy. I happen to be blind. And yes, you know, that's a, that's a big thing. I do consider it a, a disability. Uh, in my opinion, it's not just a nuisance. Um, and it does uh, impart special challenges. But when you really boil it down, and I'm sure my wife would agree with this if she were here right now, but I'm just a regular guy for the most part. Uh, my my blindness does not define who I am as a human being. It does very little to talk about just who the person is that I am. Mm -hmm. Hey, so just to let you know, Jerry, I I have real trouble monitoring the chat in these um, in these kinds of events, but I've just seen a couple pop up with a, at least one person's offered to go birding with you, Carrie. Um, another one of our wonderful birdability captains said she had an awesome time birding with you the other week, and Emerson, another one of our wonderful volunteers says she wants to go birding with you so you might oh and michael as well so uh, you might have a few um, birding buddies i know i used to live in boston for two years and i wish i knew you then because i would have had a great time birding with you um so there's definitely a few willing willing birding buddies um uh for you i've got two more questions to ask um folks just so you know so we're trying to time this interview to finish in about five minutes um but then we have another half an hour for all the q a so if you have to go this is being recorded you can definitely catch up with it later on the birdability or abc youtube channels but um there's a lot of questions in the q a box so we're about to get there but before i do two more questions for you jerry one is um could you i bet you have a whole lot but could you give us if there's any, um, well, we know there's there's some folks here who are blind or have low vision or, or go birding with someone who who um, is blind or has low vision. Could you give us your three top tips or tricks um, for birding um, while blind? Yes. Um, one of my greatest tools is that I have <clears throat> amassed a, a pretty good supply of identified bird sounds. Um, I've bought CDs. There are lots of them out there, and there's there's even a lot available on the web now. It can be a little more cumbersome to get at sometimes, but I I need to have sounds that I can compare what I've listened to 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 see if I'm really hearing what I think I'm hearing. Um, I also use mnemonics a lot. I use um, words to remember what a bird seems to be saying, and of course, it's the eastern toe. He really doesn't say "drink your tea," but it sounds like it to me, and I. I love using mnemonics like that. I'm not very creative, so I don't make up my own, but there are plenty of them out there that can be found. Mm -hmm. So I use those. I also carry a digital recorder with me most of the time when I'm out and think there may be birds around. And I'm, I've got my ears tuned for birds everywhere I go. As soon as I get out of a car, wherever I am, immediately I start hearing the birds if I can. And, and uh, so that's, those are a couple of things. I also, um, well, I can't think of the other ones at the moment. So well, that was free. That was perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and we, we actually have, we have a description of Jerry's um, recorder and his amazing outdoor microphone setup on the outside of his house, up on the BirdAbility website under Adaptive Birding Equipment, that web page. Um, so if you are interested in that setup or you want to like get some recommendations, check that out because Jerry shared that with us. Um, so it's, it's up there. Um, also, if anyone who is here who is blind or has low vision, uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, there's a survey and it asks you questions like about, you know, if you enjoyed this webinar, but it also asks if you have a similar access challenge, what your tips and tricks are and what your resources are and what you need from sighted birders to feel more welcome and included. And we'd really love for you to share your experiences with us there because we'll collate them anonymously um, and create a resource on our website so that more folks who want to be more welcoming and inclusive can learn and more folks who are blind or have low vision whether they're beginner birders or have been birding for a long time um, can can learn from you know our kind of collective knowledge so please please do um, have a go at that that post webinar survey and if you need it in another format um, for accessibility please please let us know so we can get that out to you um, Jerry my last series of questions um so uh 
many non-disabled people are really curious about someone with a disability, uh, but they may ask some questions that are inappropriate or uncomfortable or just plain invasive. Um, I know some people uh, are more than happy to answer those questions, or maybe they're only happy to answer those questions sometimes in some contexts, um, not if they're in a rush or something, for example. But um, so I have a couple of these kinds of questions. Now, before I before I talk to you about these questions, Jerry, I want to let everyone know Jerry and I talked about these ahead of time. Um, he gave me is okay to ask them. If he wasn't comfortable, I wouldn't be asking them, but they're not appropriate questions to ask someone you've just met who's totally blind. Um, maybe if you know them really well and they've given you permission, but these are these are these questions are red flagged. So I have a little red flag here that I'm gonna wave as I ask them, just just for the folks who can see, um, as a bit of a reminder that these these questions are not appropriate questions to ask. So Jerry, you don't have to answer them if you don't want to. I'm just gonna run through them really quickly. But um, so red flagged. Um, can you really not see anything? <laughs> well, that's a good one. And I'm asked that more often than you might think. Um, I wear sunglasses for cosmetic reasons. And sometimes, you know, people, they, they, it's hard to imagine that someone is totally blind. And actually, a lot of people who are blind are not totally blind. A lot of us do have either light perception or even a very small amount of vision. But that is a rather invasive question. If I say I'm blind, that should be good enough for, for our first meeting together. So, but I, I actually am totally blind and have been, I, the only thing I ever saw was light. And that was when I was a kid and that was a long time ago. So uh, yes, I'm, I'm the real deal, as they say. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So my next invasive question was, why do you always wear sunglasses? But you, you kind of answered that. Um, yes, I, I do wear them for cosmetic reasons, and that took a lot of um, soul searching on my part to decide to do that, because I used to always say, I'll never be one of those stereotypical blind people that wear sunglasses all the time, because I didn't want to look different, but I, I do wear them for cosmetic reasons and, and no other reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, have you really got extra special hearing because you can't see? <laughs> The older I get, the easier it is to answer that question with a, a <laughs> resounding no. Um, it is true that people who are blind may attempt to make better use of the hearing they have. There is no question about that. Um, I also know a lot of blind people who have perfect pitch or absolute pitch, as it's called, with music. They can hear a note and know what it is. I don't think that's because they're blind. Um, because there's a certain percentage of the general population that, that has that ability. But I think a lot of it too has to do with, as, as people who are blind, we pay more attention to sounds and we tend to be exposed more often to more things that make noises. And um, so, yeah, um, I've forgotten what your question was now. Oh, it was about the no, what, what was extra your question? Oh, hearing. about the extra you special it, senses. Yes. Um, um, so the answer is no. We're, but we do learn to use our, our other senses, just as I think probably many people who are deaf would say that they are more visu visually vigilant mm -hmm. than people who are hearing because mm -hmm. they have to rely on their sight to be aware of things more than other people do. Mm -hmm. And then the last one I have, which we kind of already answered, but but the last question that I had of in, intrusive questions was, um, how do you read? Uh, <laughs> well, that's a great question. I don't, that question wouldn't bother me. Um, I, I read with Braille and I learned it when I was in first grade and got, I was really good at it by the time I was in fourth grade, as were my, my classmates. But not everyone uses Braille. Some people listen to audio instead of reading um, especially adults who lose their sight find it very difficult to learn, learn Braille because it is, it uses the tip of one of your fingers or a couple of fingers that has to be able to go very rapidly across a line of Braille dots and decipher them. And it's not easy to learn. It's, it's like learning a whole new language. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I do read Braille. And then I, another thing, um, 
I know when you and I were talking about about this interview and these questions and everything else, you said something um, that you said was definitely offensive. Um, you said that some people, you've had people in your life at various points, random people say things like, you're lucky you can't see all this bad stuff goes on in the world and you don't have to know about it. Yes. And again, that's a very patronizing statement that is well-meaning, but well-meaning doesn't always mean that things are appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had more than one person say that to me, implying that because I'm blind, I have no awareness of what's going on in the world and also no ability to feel emotions about things and nothing could be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you for, thank you for sharing all of that and, and, um, helping us you know learn what is or maybe is not in this case appropriate to to ask someone who's who's blind um before we get into the q a i just wanted to ask if you have anything else you'd like to share about being a birder who's totally blind i do i i want to say that when i think about it i'm actually surprised at how many other directions my interest in birding has taken me I've learned about audio editing because I wanted to be able to record bird sounds and, and put them on my website. Um, I've, I've gotten interested in nature. I've gotten interested in the environment and a lot of other things specifically because I started doing birding at a young age. And uh, so it's, you just never know where, where an interest like this is going to lead you. And it can, it has added so much to my life. It's, I just can't even put it into words. That's so awesome. Um, so, okay, we've got a bunch of questions. Folks, if you have a look in the Q&A box, um, you can upvote a question if you think that's a question you would like to hear Jerry's answer to. Um, and that will help me because as they get, vote, like the more popular questions get go, pushed up to the top of the box. So if you want to spend a little minute in the Q&A box and just see if there's any questions you would particularly like to hear Jerry answer, and um, that will help me ask questions that the most people want to hear. Um, Jerry, I know we had a question um, before that was sent in via, e via email, um, and it was about whether you like listening to um, the night calls of migrating um, migrating birds that, that yeah. I've always thought I would like to go birding at night during the migration uh, period, but I've never had the opportunity to do it, but it's something I've, I'd love to do. Awesome. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, oh, there was a question about whether you've had the opportunity, opportunity to hold living birds in order to put a shape with the sound. Um, I was offered the opportunity to participate in bird banding once. And unfortunately, I had a conflict at the time and couldn't do it. Um, so I really haven't had much opportunity to do that sort of thing other than uh, my son has a couple of pet birds, including chickens, which one of which he grabbed once and let me feel it. It wasn't very happy about that, though. <laughs> <laughs> but so, no, I have not had a whole lot of I I have um had the opportunity to examine um taxidermy birds in fact at the perkins school for the blind where i used to work they had a uh, almost a room full of taxidermy birds there that uh, that they they called it their tactile museum and a big part of it was birds and i enjoyed examining them but i still had difficulty learning one from another i just I just wasn't used to that sort of thing enough to really be able to, because uh, I think even when you're looking at a at a stuffed bird, you're still looking at color and and things that I might not have been aware of. I wonder if if for example you were able to go to a bird banding um, event and they could put the bird in your hand um, so that it could like be released from your hand and they told mm -hmm. you what it was and having a bit more familiarity perhaps with different species and calls and stuff, maybe that context would make that more interesting for you for the different, different birds that they might be banding. Yes. That's uh, I would love to be able to do that. And that, that actually brings out another point that as much as I listen to recordings of birds and try to learn them and identify them, once I hear that bird out in the field, I know it from then on but I can listen to those recordings forever and it just doesn't stay, it doesn't sink in until I actually hear the bird in the field because 
even the best recordings don't always sound like the bird actually sounds when it's up there in a tree and in the in its normal surroundings. Sure, sure. That that context is really really valuable. Yeah. Um, someone has asked you about trail conditions and whether you um whether you like uneven ground or gravel trails, uh, and and that might lead us into the all persons trails thing uh, yes. as well. Well, remember that I'm uh, 69 years old now, and the older I get, the more I like nice, smooth trails that are they're easy to walk on. Um, I do not enjoy climbing over rocks. I don't really like very rough terrain. I have no problem with hills, and I don't have problems with, you know, bumps in the uh, in the soil and so on. Uh, but gravel trails are great. Not so much when you're using a cane, but if I'm with a, a sighted guide, gravel trails do work fine for me, uh, except depending on the type of gravel, sometimes they could be noisy to walk on. And I kind of like quiet things. Uh, I don't like any kind of loud noises. And again, that has something to do with my age, I think, but uh, I don't enjoy loud music unless I'm the one making it. And I don't, I don't like concerts. I don't even like to hear people applaud. Uh, clapping bothers me. I don't, I just don't like the sound of it, but that's, that's just one of those things I've been told that I'm be becoming old and cranky, but I don't know <laughs> if that's true or not. <laughs> so, so that speaking of trail surfaces and accessible um, outdoor trails, um, tell us a little bit about the Mass Audubon's All Persons Trails and, and how you were involved as a consultant with them and creating um, really inclusive, accessible trails on their wildlife sanctuaries in Massachusetts. Well, I got involved with them back around uh, probably 2000. Um, they were considering putting in what they used to call a Braille trail, which was a, a trail with a rope guide that would have some Braille signage along the way. And I was really interested in that because I remembered when I was in first grade, my mom took me to school one day at the School for Blind Children in Pittsburgh, where I went. And they had a couple of trees in their front yard that had braille tags on them. And I remember as clearly as anything that she took me up to the tree and said, see if you can read this braille. And I read O-A-K. And I said, that's an oak tree. Uh, so I love that sort of thing. But anyway, I, I got involved. They, um, in their great wisdom, decided that if they were going to build a, a trail that they now call all persons trails, but one that would be particularly suitable for someone who's blind or has other sensory disabilities, that they ought to get blind people and other people with disabilities involved in the planning of it. So they invited me to become a consultant with them. And it worked out really well. And I, I developed a good relationship with a couple of people there. And I've actually been involved. I think I'm in my 13th one now. And these trails are they will take a, a trail that's already uh, ADA compliant and they will add what they call an overlay to it that might include a, a rope guide or a cable guide. It might include an audio uh, tour, which can, can be listened to by either downloading it off the web or listen to it, listening to it on your phone on the web, or even some of the places have a uh, an MP3 player called a Victor Stream, which is one that's specifically designed for people who are blind for listening to books and they've purchased these and have them available available there some of them have uh, braille and large print not only signage but also booklets describing the uh, the layout of the place and even tactile maps which is a another whole conversation we could have about maps are only understandable to me if they're very simple like something that a kindergartner might understand and that's not because I lack intelligence. It's because I don't have the experience of understanding what a map is trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, so we did, we added a lot of features like that to these trails and um, they're rather popular. Uh, they've attracted groups of people that we never dreamed they would. Um, I, I just assumed that the only people who would be interested in a trail with a rope guide is somebody who's blind. Well, that's not true. It could be someone who needs something to hold on to for various reasons, uh, for security and, and for lots of other reasons. So uh, these trails are at some of the Mass Audubon sanctuaries 
and they are available for people to experience both in some of them are available in the summer and the winter both and on some of them we've even had cell phone tours where you could use your cell phone to listen to a uh, a guided and some of them i did some of the audio for them i was the audio engineer on all of them actually um and some of them i actually did the reading of the scripts but um the um we had a lot of other things that we've added that i can't think of at the moment but we've tried to make these trails as interesting and understandable and educational and enjoyable for the the broadest possible range of people mm -hmm. including people with disabilities uh, whether they be sensory or intellectual or physical and so on uh, so that's a little bit about what that's been all about yeah thank you for sharing that um mass audubon also um created a really wonderful like booklet about what they did and why they did it for these all persons trails and that's linked on the birdability website um, to help you find it it's really really awesome i've been to a couple of their all persons trails and they're fantastic carrie has just written in the chat that tactile elements are really engaging and grounding for those of us who are autistic as well and that's a really cool thing about accessibility is that so often you might be thinking, oh, well, this is for one person, one group of people, one, one population. But very, very frequently, there's a bunch of other people who also benefit from that. And it's it's really, it's just really awesome. Also, if you're interested in learning a bit more about accessible birding locations or the physical accessibility of birding locations, I'm just putting a link in the chat now. Whoops, no, that didn't work. Uh, let's try that again. Here we go um, to our access considerations guidance document on our website. And I noticed that someone asked a question about finding accessible um, locations to go birding in. On our website, there's a thing called the birdability map. Now, unfortunately, the map is not very screen reader friendly. Um, we're working on that. This is a partnership that we have with National Audubon. Uh, and But anyone can submit the birdability map uh, and you just do a pretty straightforward survey telling us what access features are available um, at that birding location. And that way folks can find out um, where there's a question on there about features for folks who are blind or have low vision. So um, hopefully that will be a way to find these places for you. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to finding a way to create that. It's because it's on a GIS mapping platform, it's, it's, turns out to be really difficult to make it screen reader accessible but we're, we're trying to find a way to to make sure that that happens okay back to the back to the questions in here for you jerry um if a blind person was interested in trying birding can you suggest ways they might begin um well some agencies that serve people who are blind will occasionally have a birding experience i know i've done them here in uh, Eastern Massachusetts for a couple of agencies where I've gone uh, and we've done birding right on the campus of the building that I've been at. Uh, and I've also uh, done them other places too. So that's one possibility. Another possibility would, would be to contact whatever your local birding agency is and see if you could get a volunteer who might be able to go with you a, a time or two and, uh, give you the opportunity to to get introduced to it. Um, there also is a lot of information available on the web. There are there. There's a one thing that I listen to religiously, if I can say that. And I know Freya is familiar with it. It's the Talking Birds show, Talking with no G. Um, and their website, I think, is talking talkingbirds.org, if I'm not mistaken. Dot com. Yeah. Dot com. Ah talkingbirds.com they're on like their 780th um, episode and this person does a fantastic job he has a mystery bird every week where they play the sound of the bird and people can call in and guess what it what it is and boy do they get some wild guesses sometimes <laughs> but they also have educational parts to the program and uh, fun parts and Freya and some other people do what they call audio postcards, where they uh, will actually go out in the uh, in the field and have their phone with them. And when they're hearing an interesting bird, they'll make a little uh, short statement about it and introduce people to that bird, both by sound and sight, I think. Um, well, 
maybe not site, it's a radio show, but it's also, it's also on the web. Um, but there are lots of other things like that. There, there are many, uh, there's one called Bird Note, which is a daily uh, one or two minute long segment about a particular bird. It's, they're absolutely wonderful. I go on their website and listen to them all the time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I should disclose, I actually work for Talking Birds um, in my spare time. Um, <laughs> so you should totally listen to Talking Birds. It's like a 30 minute, it's a radio show and podcast about birds and conservation. And yeah, the audio postcards, I really enjoy sending them in because it's broadcast from Boston. Ray, the host, um, is in Boston, but I haven't lived in Boston for a few years and, you know, there's birds everywhere. And so it's fun to kind of share birds from from wherever uh, from wherever I am. Um I also am going to stick in the chat another link. There's some, um, we have some tips on our website about birding for folks who are blind or have low vision. I'm going to be adding some more things that we learned tonight from Jerry up there. That's also where I'll add, if you share your strategies um, in the post webinar survey, um, I'll add it up there. Um, but there's some ideas there. There's also some resources like LarkWire, the app that Jerry mentioned he uses and um, Jerry's blog. Um, and the other thing I should mention too, um, blindness and low vision. So low vision is, is a technical term, even though it might sound kind of vague in regular English, but it's the point at which, basically the point at which someone, someone's eye condition has impacted their vision such that glasses no longer help, but they still have some vision. There's all kinds of ways that can, their, in, their vision can be impacted and, you know, it, progresses often and uh, but that's different that's often a different thing than someone who's totally blind but also often very related so that you know that that's why they're kind of grouped together but um, it doesn't always overlap perfectly um, let's see another question here for you Jerry if if you're birding with sighted people and they see birds that are not singing would you like your companions to share the bird sounds with you, like via an app, if they could pull up, you know, the app to, sh to share that bird sound with you? If they could do it without it having any possibility of interfering with the bird's activity, yes, that would be great. I always like that. Um, I've gone out with birders where the whole way there in the car, if there's somebody who's a driving and another person who's not, they'll be playing bird sounds the whole way and testing me. And unfortunately, I don't always do that well because I just don't get a chance to get out in the field enough. Um, plus, I'm, I'm not I'm not a person who can remember something the first time. I, you know, I have to relearn things every year sometimes. But um, but yeah, I, I like hearing the sounds, and I also I'm fine with if there's a bird up there that's not making any sound. I love for the person with me to tell me what the bird's doing, what what kind of bird they think it is, and how they identified it, and what it's up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, and then one more question. Um, if someone, so I'm working on a program with another one of our vertibility volunteers um, for the, um, I live in Alabama, she's in Alabama as well, for the Alabama School for the Blind, um, so hopefully introducing some of the students to the joys of birds and birding and, and nature. What kind of tools um, would you, did, did you find helpful when you first were learning about birds? And what kind of tools have you used with all the different workshops and classes that you have held for folks who are blind or have low vision about birds? Well, I got my first cassette recorder specifically because of my interest in birds. And it was when cassettes were brand new and now they don't even use them anymore. <laughs> uh, but along the way, I've had various types of recorders. And now I use just an inexpensive digital recorder uh, that I can re record sounds with. Um, I use a um, usually take a, a laptop with me when I do a birding uh, by ear demonstration so that I can quickly find sounds and I have them alphabetized so I can use first letter navigation to find birds very quickly in my in my computer and play them. So I use a few little tools right like that, but that's about it really the computer and um, a recorder because that that's the way I learn new birds. If I hear a sound I I've too many times I've thought, oh, I'll remember that sound until I get home. Well, I get home and then I start listening to bird recordings and think that might have been it. Maybe that wasn't it. So I'm much better off if I actually record the sound so that I have something to compare it to. Mm -hmm. 
What about, you mentioned like the taxidermied birds. Um, one thing that we, I should have got it prepared. It's over in a cupboard somewhere, but we, um, we you know, like carved wooden birds. We, we've got um, one made that's a life-size Eastern bluebird. Um, and oh. it has like the beak and the feet and the feathers are kind of really highlighted when if it wasn't made for this, the individual feathers might not be so highlighted, but so that mm -hmm. someone could feel this bird and feel its size, feel its beak shape, um, feel that it's kind of a complex creature. Do you think that sort of thing is helpful for teaching folks, you know, first the first time you're teaching someone about birds and birding? It depends on whether it's three-dimensional, number one. Um, mm -hmm. If it's carved on a flat piece of wood, um, it does nothing for me. I just can't, uh, I don't learn anything from that. Um, but if it actually is shaped like the real bird and is the, the basic size of the real bird and it's three-dimensional, absolutely, that can help a lot. But again, if it's made out of wood, um, I'm not going to get the real feel of what the actual bird feels like from examining it, but at least... At least I would know the size and a little bit about its its shape. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that that program, by the way, if you're listening, folks, and you're interested in that, once we have run that program, hopefully next spring, um, <clears throat> I'm going to write up what we do, what how we do what we do, why we did it, so that anyone can get hold of that um, through our website. Because you might find that that's useful in your own communities. Um, you might want to host a similar program with your local school for the blind or something like that. So um, that'll be that'll be like another year away probably until that's out in the world. But um, that'll be really exciting. If you want to keep up to date with that sort of stuff and anything else that we're doing at BirdAbility, because we're doing a lot, um, please sign up for our newsletter. It's only monthly, um, but you can do that on our website. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at BirdAbility. Uh, and I'm just going to stick in the chat one final thing, which is our donate link. Um, like I said, brand new nonprofit. We just started this year and uh, anything, any donation, big or small, is, is really appreciated because um, without fundraising, we won't be able to keep doing what we're doing, which is to share the joys of birding with people who have disabilities and other health concerns. Um, thank you so much, Jerry, for sharing your experiences and your um, perspectives uh, and your wisdom with us tonight. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. And I know from the chat that a bunch of other people have really appreciated learning from you as well. Um, and thank you again, Namal and Erica and um, to our two ASL interpreters and for everyone coming tonight. Um, please don't forget that survey at the end. We're really excited to hear your, um, your thoughts and your own experiences in there as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Freya. This has been fun, and I hope it's been enjoyable to other people, but I certainly enjoyed myself. I'm glad <laughs> to hear it. Jerry, thank you, Freya. Um, before we go, uh, thanks also to uh, Christina and to Paula and Erica. Um, but before we go, I was going to ask one last question um, that's from the Q&A box about um, locating accessible trails. There was one question. I can't remember if you got to that one, Freya. So I mentioned really briefly that the birdability map is um, the best Excellent. resource we know of. Oh, right. Um, and the screen reading being difficult. Yeah, yeah. There is another website um, called Nature for All. And they, um, I'm working with those folks too a little bit. They have particularly... Um, braille trails so trails that have you know the guide rope and braille signs and stuff like that um, on their website too so that's something else to check out as well if you're interested in in more braille trails and just that's googling awesome. something like accessible trails will usually yield some some good stuff maybe with the location where yes. you are as yep. well um, yep. Thank you so much, Jerry, for sharing all those experiences. Um, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us and for staying for a full 90 minutes. <laughs>